Uh, first of all, why do we need this center? So I'm gonna give my own personal opinion, um, which is pretty simple, that uh, we are at the point now where science fairly regularly uh, is uh, making breakthroughs or promising breakthroughs that can bring change uh, really at a global uh, species level, uh, both positive and potentially negative. Um, we've seen two technologies that have already done this in the past, one being nuclear technology and the other one being the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and I would say we've survived nuclear technology by the skin of our teeth on multiple occasions. Um, I think this is really proof of the multiverse theory, uh, which says we just happen to be in the in the, the universe where we did survive, and all in all the other ones we didn't. Um, and uh, you know, fossil fuels. I would say we maybe we've lost that battle. So we'll see. Um, these things are happening more and more quickly. And my goal in setting in setting up this center. Uh, is to try to help get the next few decades right, that we don't make the same kinds of mistakes that we've made with these, um, with these other technologies. But getting the next decade right means we have to have a meaning for the word right. And as we'll see in many of the presentations today, uh, that's a very contested question. Um, and it's not up to us to decide what's right. Uh, and so it's, it's really up to the human race to decide what's right. Uh, so these are the three questions that we're gonna uh, organize our research around. So first of all, understanding uh, what does the human race mean by getting the next few decades right? What are the interests that are affected uh, and what obligations do those interests put on us uh, as scientific researchers and philosophers and ethicists and lawyers and so on? Um, we also need to understand how uh, science and, te and technology are going to develop in future. Um, and that may include uh, adding areas beyond the ones that we've, uh, that we've already uh, listed, um, AI, gene editing, and uh, neurotechnology. Um, and then we want to actually affect change. I think this is a sort of Berkeley tradition. Uh, we're not just an ivory tower. We actually want to get out there and make the world a better place. And so uh, for science and technology, that may mean uh, affecting public policy. It may mean affecting how science even thinks of itself. And you know, what, is, what does it mean to get up and be a scientist of type X every day, right? Uh, if we can change that, then we may not need uh, you know, such uh, drastic changes in public policy. Uh, and we don't need to be so concerned about the risks if scientists will take that on board in what they actually do every day. So here's the structure of the center. Uh, this is really the only reason I have PowerPoint, so I can show you this picture, uh, which we, uh, and I think this isn't the latest one, actually. Lee has been refining it still further, but I forgot to put the new one in. But we've been refining this picture over and over. So the idea of, of hub and spoke is pretty common, but it sort of also brings into mind a wheel spinning by itself. Uh, so we wanted to have an axle, which is what connects the wheel uh, to actually, you know, forward motion that bring up uh, difficult questions. Um, the hub is where those are discussed between the scientists and the philosophers and the lawyers and public policy experts and journalists and so on. Um, so the axle is what drives change in the world and also connects the wheel, the hub, the spokes uh, to the public, to all the stakeholders, to the, uh, the you know, ordinary people and their interests in the future and so on. So this is really uh, a cross-campus effort. Um, I think we're potentially including more than half of the departments on campus uh, in what we're doing here. Um, so just very briefly, I'll go through each, of, each part of this. So the hub, as I said, is is where the philosophers, the ethicists, and so on work with uh, the scientists and then uh, with the public uh, to figure out answers to some of these core questions. Or at least, you know, this is where I, 
disagree with the philosophers or the philosophers disagree with me. You know, philosophers are quite happy for questions not to be answered for actually thousands of years, um, and that's fine. Uh, and I, I can see that perspective. Uh, you know, as an AI researcher, I'm worried that if we don't answer these questions, then the AI systems will answer them for us, not in the sense of solving the problem, but actually just implementing some uh, unsuspected solution uh, that may not be the one that we want. Um, so there's uh, here are just some of the people who uh, who have. Uh, in some sense, signed up to be part of this effort uh, in the hub, in uh, primarily in philosophy, but also in other areas, politics and law, and so on. Um, so the axle makes this uh, connection between uh, the sort of academic core and, and the real world concerns. And if you if you take a kind of maybe this is a 19th century view of science, right? That you know, knowledge is just good. In the worst case, and this is actually you know a theorem in uh, in decision theory, right? That the expected value of information is non-negative. And and how do you prove that theorem? You simply say, well, if you don't like what you find, don't do anything with it, right? Um, and so uh, so from that point of view, right? All knowledge is good because you know there's good new things we can do with it, and you know if there are bad things we can do with it, we won't do the bad. Things. So that's all fine, right? But obviously, the world is not ideal, um, and all of this really is around the non-ideality of the world. Um, and you can think of this in two ways: one is uh, making science safer for the world, meaning scientists refrain from doing things that uh, are very likely in practice in the world as it is to lead to negative outcomes, right? So. Uh, one example that I sometimes use, particularly when scientists tell me, as they often do, uh, that they shouldn't be involved in policy, that all they do is produce new knowledge, and it's entirely up to other people to use that knowledge as they see fit, right? Um, and that's the democratic process. Uh, that was the argument used by the scientists who produced Zyklon B, uh, the gas used in the gas chambers uh, in the Second World War. Um, they were the first people to be executed in the Nuremberg trials. So that argument didn't go very far. Uh, and I don't think it should go very far in the way we think about our responsibilities as scientists. We have to take into account the fact that we actually work in the world as it is. Um, but we could also uh, change the way the world works, maybe for the better, um, so that when new knowledge is produced that, that has nefarious uses, it's less likely to get used in that way. And that makes the world a safer place to do science because it's not always possible to tell what, what your science is going to produce. Uh, and you need, you need that freedom in order to make progress. Um, there's also uh, a number of issues around public perception, particularly today, uh, where uh, science is becoming associated with one particular political party in the US. Uh, and um, uh, and and uh, blamed by the other party for all kinds of things. Um, and then, uh, you know, how, if you've ever worked in public policy uh, on scientific questions, it's an extremely difficult process. Uh, most of these questions are not uh, bread and butter questions that are going to affect constituents uh, in the next few months. This process of affecting public policy uh, and how science is governed uh, is a really difficult uh, and complicated one. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, one of the primary functions of this axle is to bring in the concerns uh, that uh, human stakeholders have uh, around the scientific questions. And so this includes uh, the deans of all the professional schools who wrote wonderful letters uh, supporting the proposal, um, but also people in other departments, sociology, political science, and so on, um, that, that we deal with the world as it really is. Um, and now we have the three spokes. We already talked about uh, genome editing. Uh, the question, you know, do we want to have uh, enhanced genetic enhancement of our children uh, and the, the specter of eugenics? Um, but even questions like, you know, as we ad maybe adapt to space habitats or colonizing Mars, we may end up creating actually new species of humans. How do we feel about that? Um, and those are interesting kinds of questions. 
uh, in neuroscience, um, the technology uh, is moving ahead quite rapidly. Um, and we may soon see the capability for uh, technological enhancement of mental capabilities. Uh, and then, you know, if that becomes, you know, we've got rid of the SATs, if you replace that with, you know, uh, what, what grade of neural enhancement have you had uh, in order to get into our program, uh, then we're out of the frying pan into the fire. Um, privacy, uh, you know, what happens if we can actually uh, join minds together uh, into uh, a, a sort of a unified Borg consciousness, uh, all these kinds of issues we are just beginning to go through. And then with AI, um, there are many, many questions. I'll talk about some of them. Uh, what happens uh, if humans become mostly redundant in our civilization uh, and there's no longer even a need for the next generation of humans to know how to run the civilization that we live in? Um, and what happens if we lose control altogether? Um, then we could also talk about other spokes that we, uh, we could add in. And this will be one of the processes we engage in all the time uh, is to think about what else is on the horizon, what else do we need to worry about. Um, one of the people we talked to uh, raised the issue of what happens as we move out from the earth uh, into space and all the kinds of of legal questions, of philosophical, biological questions that uh, that brings up. Uh, other people said, what about climate engineering? Like, how do we even decide uh, who gets to do it and, uh, and whether it gets done? Uh, and does it actually make the problem worse in the sense of then making it easier for us to continue pumping out carbon dioxide? Um, so we're running the air conditioning and the heating system at the same time, um, or whatever other field people want to talk about. So there are tons and tons of uh, faculty members who are excited and, and um, would like to be involved in this. Uh, and so that creates an enormous opportunity for students to get engaged uh, with their existing advisor, but uh, then starting to participate in the life of the center. So those are the gene editing people, these are the neuroscientists, these are the AI faculty. Um, and across all these folks, there are many, many issues that are the same. And this is one of the reasons why we want to have the center uh, is to bring people together who unknowingly share the same kinds of ethical issues at, at, at some level of abstraction. Um, so for example, just to pick one, uh, present versus future generations, right? something that philosophers have talked about for a long time and economists have talked about for a long time. Um, and obviously this has um, a presence in uh, the genome, genome editing and in AI, uh, when we think about how AI systems make decisions. Uh, plasticity of human preferences is another one, right? For you know, genome editing, do we ask us whether we want our great-grandchildren to have two heads, or do we ask our great-grandchildren whether they like having two heads? And of course, they're gonna say, well, I don't know how you guys got by with one, right? Of course we wanna have two heads, right? But we might, now I think this is a, a really undesirable future for the human race. Um, so there's lots of things that will go on. Uh, hopefully this center will be a hive of activity. The core of it is going to be obviously the students and postdocs uh, who, let's face it, do the real work uh, on the campus. And um, so we'll be offering uh, fellowships, as many as we can afford. Uh, we'll develop courses. Uh, we will look at, on a regular basis, other areas of science and technology uh, to anticipate risks. Um, we'll have all kinds of uh, joint activities, uh, seminars, conferences, retreats. Uh, if we can afford it, uh, visitor programs that may, we may bring people to campus for six months at a time uh, in fairly large numbers to work on important questions together in the way that, for example, the Simons Institute does in theoretical computer science. Uh, these are very, very effective uh, kinds of programs. Um, and then we'll actually be trying to change the world for the better. We also have to actually raise some money. So I want to mention that at the end. Um, and I'm happy to announce that the, uh, the DALHAP Foundation, uh, DALHAP stands for Do As Little Harm As Possible, uh, I thought it was some Swiss hedge fund, but no, it's actually <laughs> it's actually a, uh, a, a a very well-meaning foundation. So Dalhap Foundation has has already agreed to provide 
$500,000 in matching funds. Uh, for the center. And with that, we'll uh, let uh, the